Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it together. I am grateful that you are here this morning to join us in worship. On this first Sunday of October, it is World Communion Sunday, and you will hear a little bit more about that during our uh, offering time. It is also the beginning of our stewardship emphasis, and I am so excited about the work that has been done. Um, there will be a lot of information on our website and opportunities for you to enjoy videos that highlight the ministries and work of this church. So there will be more information coming as the, month, um, as the month goes on. It is almost time for Advent. <laughs> time does move on. And uh, many of you submitted uh, devotions for the Advent booklet last year. We would love to have those and even some new folks to participate in that. Those devotionals are due on this Friday. So please submit those to um, Berry Christmas, and there's uh, information on the screen here about how to submit those. This is World Communion Sunday, and we are excited to be offering Holy Communion this afternoon in person, outdoors, and also on Wednesday at noon. And there's been a lot of information in the, the messenger and um, in your emails that is this afternoon at 1, 3, and 6 and then Wednesday at noon, and then at two and four on Zoom if you're not able to come here. And there's information uh, that was in the Friday email and other uh, publications. Some of you have asked about now, what will that be like outdoors? And I just want to let you know when we say that communion will be provided to you, that this is what it looks like. And I want to just show you how easy this is. Um, it's easier for me when I put on my reading glasses, which I don't have right now. But there is the juice, and here is the wafer inside the lid. And when you get it, if you sort of play with this flap, <laughs> it is in two pieces. And there is a cellophane, clear cellophane, that you pull off first. And there is the wafer. And then you pull off the second foil that you hold carefully, you pull that off, and there is the juice. And then there will be uh, garbage cans for you to dispose of that when we leave. I want to say to you, if you accidentally pull off the whole thing, and then you can't get the wafer out, it's okay. You can take it home with you later and open it and have a prayer at home and partake. If the juice spills out, it is okay. The important thing is that we are all together. This is new for each of us. And so we give ourselves grace as we experience God's grace. I hope to see you this afternoon or evening or Wednesday afternoon, or perhaps see you on Zoom later today. God bless you.
Will you join me in our call to worship? Come to Christ, that living stone, rejected by the world, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. We have responded to God's call and seek to be built into a spiritual house, a living reminder of God's presence on earth. Will you join me in singing our opening hymn, Christ is Made the Sure Foundation. be with you. Let us pray. God, our beloved, you set before us the goal of new life in Christ. May we live in the power of his resurrection and bring forth the fruit of your gentle and loving rule. Amen. Good morning. I'd like to invite all the children to gather up, get comfy, and listen up. Today is a very special today. Today, today is World Communion Sunday, and this is a globe. 
How many of y'all have ever seen a globe? Globes are really cool because when they're on their stands, you can spin them and see all the different countries that the world has and all the different continents. And what makes today special with World Communion Sunday is that all the Christians all over the world are coming together and joining in celebrating communion or our Last Supper. And it's just a reminder that all of us, that Jesus came for all of us and that he's with all of us who say that we love him and we believe in him. So it helps us remember that we're not in this alone, that there are other Christians all over this globe that celebrate Jesus and love Jesus as much as we do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are able to celebrate with Christians all over the globe the fact that your son died for us. We ask that we remember not just this on this day, but every day that we are never alone, that you are with us, but there are other Christians with us. Amen. Today, as we celebrate World Communion Sunday, we will participate in the Sacrament of Communion this afternoon, but we'll also be sharing in a special offering. This is one of several Sundays throughout the course of the Christian year in which our focus truly and specifically turns outwards. So the proceeds of offerings from World Communion Sunday go to assist the World Communion Scholarship Fund that specifically provides scholarships for international and United States students who, of different ethnicities as they pursue education here and abroad. May we support the education efforts of our fellow Christians on this World Communion Sunday.
Please join me for our prayer for illumination. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the third chapter of Philippians, verses 4b through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a er, persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts gathered here be pleasing and acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, between last Sunday and this morning, your clergy have made what seems to be a dramatic shift and jumped from Old Testament Exodus stories to the epistle readings from our lectionary as we look at Philippians. And, what, and one could think, oh good, Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. Well, that's next week. Uh, it is a happy letter, and it is. I often tell people, if you've never read the Bible, just start with Philippians, and then Matthew 5 through 7, and then there's some other things, but Philippians is a good place to start. It is a love letter, really, uh, from Paul to a church that he is so connected to, that he's very attached to. It is full of thanksgiving, which is appropriate on this first Sunday of our stewardship emphasis, lots of thanksgiving in Philippians. We've just come from stories of the wilderness, though, in Exodus these last few weeks. And Paul, in the midst of all the joy and rejoice and thankfulness, is dealing with a wilderness. Not his own, really, but his people. His beloved Philippians are caught between the tug or the pull of the promised land and the tug of being pulled back to the way things were. 
the beginning and end of chapter three were not in our assigned readings for the lectionary, but these bookends help us understand what Paul is writing about. He's warning the Philippians. When you read the first and last parts of chapter three, he's warning the Philippians about the evildoers. And the evildoers are not the Romans or the pagans or those enemies beyond the gate. The evildoers are the ones in their own community, in, the own, in their own community of faith, their fellow believers. Believers who are saying, you must do this to be saved. You have to do this first before you can be a follower of Christ. This is more important. This is the test of true belief. And for the Philippian community, it is those who believe that Jesus is indeed Lord and Savior, but are wanting to hold on to the traditions from Abraham of circumcision, and then especially following those food laws for good measure. And so when Paul talks about gluttony and mutilation, it is harking back to the, to the circumcision and following those food laws. Yes, Jesus is Lord, but you must do this to obtain salvation. You must follow this practice to really be a follower. And this is causing Paul so much anguish and hurt. He wants the Philippians to understand what it means to truly receive Jesus. Just because we are no longer in the book of Exodus does not mean that we are out of the wilderness. There are plenty of opportunities for gnashing of teeth and wrong turns and believing that Pharaoh, whoever or whatever Pharaoh is to you, really had our best interest at heart. There are folks saying this way and folks saying that way. There are debates about what is essential and what is the most important thing and even debates about what is true and what are facts. And just all of this cacophony of voices until there is meaningless noise in our heads and in our spirit and in our hearts. Paul is making it absolutely clear to the believers in Philippi and to us that a decision must be made. We are at a turning point. We must move ahead with our eyes on the cross or we lose everything. But, you know, at any time we read Paul, there's always this, yes, so on and so forth, but, or I know I said this, however, so yes, we must keep our eyes on the cross or we will lose everything. But, Paul says, we must lose everything to gain everything and everything is Jesus Christ and life in him. Paul is pointing to the cross and saying, this is life. If it were not for the cross, I would have no life. My life is in Jesus. My life is in the Jesus who died on the cross, who emptied himself out and gave himself for us and then defeated death and was resurrected and is here with us now. That is where my life is. The scripture that we heard in the, the middle of chapter 3 this morning could sound like a very humble, self-effacing acceptance speech. You've heard those of, yes, yes, I have all these credentials. I, I am very, um, have had the best upbringing in the best schools, but I couldn't have done it all by myself. Thank you, God, for all the, for being by my side, and thank you, God, for all of this. I love the, the interviews after every you know, game when the star athlete is there on the field with the reporter or there in the stands, and, or maybe they've won the big game or the big tournament, and the, the sports reporter is going down all of the accolades for this athlete. Um, you, have the, you have the greatest stats of anyone on your team, you've hit the most home runs, you have the highest number of rebounds, you have more tackles than anyone. My imaginary athlete plays all of the sports. Um, and then the athlete sort of bows his head and shrugs and says, well, yes, 
But if it weren't for my teammates and a great coach and all the fans, I would not have been able to accomplish all that I have. Well, sometimes we, especially those of us who have credentials, and don't we all, we can all point to good decisions that were made or things that we have accomplished or things that have been given to us or lessons that our parents have taught us. We read this as an exercise in humility. We read it as an exercise of saying, thank you for all that you've given me. I, I couldn't have done this without you, God. Later this month, we will be asking you to fill out a pledge card to think about your gifts to the church. And our staff has put together some amazing videos that celebrate all of the ministries of our church and all that is going on. And it's a way for us to say thank you to you for the gifts that you've given. Your gifts are a way for you to say thank you to God for all that God has, has given. And, uh, but there is more than being thankful. <laughs> we just started the book study last week on Diana Butler Bass's book called Grateful. And I'm, I'm already hearing the conversations we're going to have based on the conversations we had last week about how we say thank you and what does it mean to be grateful. I think in this passage, this is more than saying thank you. And before we can say thank you to God, we say yes to God. We make a decision to receive, to affirm that he is the giver of our life. Paul uses athletic language at the end, knowing that his readers will be very familiar with the chariot race imagery. And we've used this language to encourage our children and youth to work hard, press hard, Press on, keep moving, keep your eyes on the prize. But let us remember, when Paul is writing this, he is not writing it at the gym or at the track. He is in prison. He is confined when he talks about pressing on. In the quiet and stillness of a prison, Paul pulls all the energy of a chariot race and says, look at the cross, look to Jesus. Chariot racers would, those, you've seen Ben-Hur, <laughs> would hold those long reins and wrap them around their body. And with those reins wrapped around their body, if they looked anywhere but straight ahead, there would be danger. If they turn to the right or the left, or if they turn to, to look behind them, or if they looked up in the stands to see the cheering crowds, that movement could miscue, give the wrong signal to the horse, and there would be a crash, maybe even death of the chariot racer. We can almost hear Jesus say, to be fit for the kingdom of heaven, you put your hand to the plow and you don't look back, that we are focused, we are focused on Jesus Christ, and then everything else follows after that. Many of us will join later today or on Wednesday for Holy Communion. This is the beginning of our communion service. And as we come to the table later today or later in the week, we persevere. We keep our eyes on the cross, on the grace of Christ. We are not holding our, uh, our goals or our successes or our attempt to be better or our right beliefs or our high morals or our traditions or even observing Holy Communion the right way. We don't put all that before Christ. We cling to the cross. We cling to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that is where we have our life. Then our, our goals and our trying to be better and our beliefs and our traditions and even our gifts, our tithes and our offerings and our ministries here and all that we celebrate, those are all responses to knowing that it is Jesus Christ who gives us life. 
Nothing else matters, Paul says. All that I have, all that I have obtained and earned, it is rubbish. It is rubbish when compared to the glory of the cross. As we prepare to receive Holy Communion, let us keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and just accept that he is the one who gives us life. We don't look behind us thinking there are things I have done or I am not worthy or what about this or what about that. We do not take our eyes off of Jesus and think, well, am I good enough? Let me look at my list and check down and see if, if, if I'm worthy to come here. I don't look to the right or the left to compare myself with others to see who is coming and are we doing this the correct way. If our eyes are on Christ and we receive his gift, that is life and nothing else matters. I am thankful that you are here today to receive the gift of Jesus Christ and in receiving then we can respond with a grateful heart. Amen. My name is Keith Biggers, and I'm the 
team leader for a benevolence team here at Church Street United Methodist Church. I think uh, one of the things that I realize uh, sitting in the congregation uh, is the fact that um, for the most of us that live privileged lives, uh, we go through our lives not realizing that there are others out there uh, that are desperate to make ends meet. Those that are homeless, those that can't pay bills, those that have family members that are incarcerated. The list goes on and on and on. We fail to realize the value that we can be to those. That's not to say that we should always give to everybody at the stoplight, but certainly uh, we have a responsibility and we have the privileges to do it and we should never be turning our back on those less fortunate than ourselves. Uh, benevolence means to me the, the um, my service and giving back for all the things that I have been given in life. I realize that I have been very fortunate and a very privileged individual and I know that there are those in our community that are not. Uh, for me to be able to help uh, has meant a great deal to me. Uh, I think the good Lord has always said that, uh, uh, that if you have helped those, the least of these, then you have helped us. Uh, that's been my mantra, that we should uh, continue to help. Well, I, again, I believe that uh, our, our service to our Lord is, is extremely important. And I think we are tasked as Christians to give back uh, through our faith and through our service to our community. There are so many in our community that need this assistance. And uh, I have taken it upon myself as a challenge. I know my Heavenly Father and my Father on Earth both showed me the way and I have always continued to try to make both of them proud with me. It is through that service that I have been uh, connected to my Lord and I hope that he looks upon my work uh, as favorable and uh, that has certainly enriched my faith and made me closer to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, in your Son, Jesus Christ, we know the power of his resurrection and the promise of his kingdom. May we imitate the Apostle Paul, who sought to be shaped in every part of his life to live like Christ. We pray for your Holy Spirit to enter our collective hearts and to shape us to love you and one another with such commitment that we would be known for a loving humility. We pray for those who suffer and are in any kind of trouble. We think of those whose suffering we have contributed to or ignored. May we seek to see where your kingdom is even now breaking into our world and then seek to be faithful to it. Casting aside our own ambitions and achievements and pressing on to the goal of your blessed kingdom. We lift up the hungry, the lonely, the sick, the outcast, and the grieving. Jesus invites them to his table. So lead us that we may make room for them in our lives. On this day, that we seek the nourishment of your grace at the table and in fellowship. Open up our hearts that we might acknowledge our need for you, O God. Forgive us where we have hardened our hearts to our neighbors. Have mercy on us as we acknowledge, like the Apostle Paul, our stubborn pride. Feed us with your grace by the power of your Holy Spirit, that in being sustained by your love, we might grow, that you might grow your kingdom in our midst. It is trusting in Christ Jesus that we join together and pray the prayer which he taught us, saying now, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we prepare to meet Christ at his table and move into a new day and new relationships with each other, may you know full well the assurance, the confidence of the love of Almighty God, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and for always. Amen. Yeah.